Welcome everyone. As we start the next session for meeting the challenge of accessibility, inclusion and access in online education with Sushi Yish Horowitz, Senior Learning Technologist at Queen Mary University of London. She's responsible for enhancing e-learning practice across all academic disciplines and is currently working on ensuring equity of experience for students during the challenges of remote teaching and assessment during the COVID-19 crisis, a work that will have a lot of importance even as we come out of the crisis. With that, let me hand over to Soshi. Thank you very much. So as I said, I'm going to be speaking about the challenges of accessibility and looking at where we are now, what the challenges are going forward and also um, historically going back in time at how we can learn lessons from the past in meeting the challenges of access and inclusion in the future. As Vista has said, this is really close to the work I do in my job at Queen Mary University of London. It's close to what we all do at Queen Mary because part of our 2030 strategy is our ambition to be the most inclusive university of its kind. And this is something we take very seriously at Queen Mary's. We're a large research university in East London. We're in the Russell Group of Universities, but we have a very specific student demographic at Queen Mary's. 90%, over 90% of our home students are come from the state education system. They're not privately educated. And 40% of our home students are the first in their family to receive a university education. In addition to that, we also have a very international presence on our campuses, over 600, sorry, over 160 nationalities uh, at our London campuses. And we also have campuses around the world. So we have a lot of inclusion challenges at the moment, which we're really proud of meeting and delivering education to our students. But of course, you can never just say that you're inclusive and that your education is accessible. Instead, the, the challenge is to say, how can we continue to be inclusive as times change, as we saw very much with the COVID crisis, and also just in general, as technology and societies change around us. This is our 2030 strategy, and online education is going to be a really crucial part of what we do, which brings its own opportunities for inclusion, but also its own challenges. So I said, we'd be starting by looking back at some lessons learned about this. This does also come from Queen Mary's to an extent, because Queen Mary University is part of the University of London. And over 150 years ago, the University of London was a pioneer of distance education, taking advantage at the time of the sudden increase in, and um, development of communications technology that enabled distance learning to be a reality. And the fans of the University of London did this to increase access and inclusion in university education. This is an extract of Charles Dickens's journal all the year round in 1859. And he wrote this glowing article about the English People's University, which is what he called the University of London. He said specifically, every hard worker who can prove his competence may come for a degree to the University of London. And this was radical. This meant that from whatever background, a student happened to come, whatever class, whatever amount of privilege or wealth, even whatever religion, unlike Oxford and Cambridge, which were the other two English options at the time, you didn't have to be Protestant in order to come for a degree to the University of London. And I think we can share Dickens's enthusiasm for this, but we can also critique it because Dickens is not being accidental with his language here. He says, every worker who can prove his competence and it's not an accidental use of the pronoun there. Dickens is only talking about men because radical as the University of London was in increasing access, they hadn't considered inclusion in the way we do now and they were only looking at access for men. What's interesting is what happened next. Sutherland writes, the great the revolutionary feature about the University of London was that it did not require residence of its students. This great fact allowed the separation of the question of how and in what context you learned. So because students for the first time didn't have to leave to go to live in a specific hall of residence or a university area, and they could simply attend lectures to learn, women could suddenly take part. 
And under a decade after Dickens wrote that article, we had the first British women having access to university education. And a year later, the first degrees were awarded to women. A decade later, the charter was obtained to allow women to sit exams on equal status to men. And the first exams were taken a year later. So we can see here how structural changes in an idea of what a university is can radically improve access. And looking ahead to what I'm going to be talking about, we can maybe see something similar with online education. Suddenly whole new demographics are able to access education. There is another side of this story though. This doesn't happen in a vacuum. At the same time as all of these dramatic increases are being made, the University of London was facing a crisis because most of its students weren't passing the exams. In 1865, 70% of students who were studying purely independently, attending lectures and then coming for exams, failed their papers. And around this time, they started to reintroduce residences, the aim being to reintroduce the support that came with more intense teaching rather than it all being self-directed learning on the part of the students. The good news is, because of this huge increase and in accessibility and in what university education meant, it wasn't a backward step. In fact, in 1882, the first women's college was opened up. It was Westfield College. It is in fact now part of the University of, uh, of Queen Mary University of London. And we can see that by changing the ethos and changing the mission of the university, policy and strategy decisions can take into account lessons learned, but can move on so that you do end up developing the way you run a university, developing the way you deliver education in order to meet new and emerging access needs. So that's our positive story and the thing we can learn from the past. But we can also learn by seeing other things that have changed since Dickens was writing. So let's go back to this quotation again. Every hard worker who can prove his competence may come for a degree to the University of London. And anyone in my audience here who's used to working in accessibility or in inclusion will see that there are still some issues with Dickens's phrasing. He says, any hard worker who can prove his competence may come themselves, which means that we're putting the burden onto the students. We're telling them that the university might stay where it is, it's the students who have to do all the direction, have to do all the traveling. And this is not where we currently are in thinking about access. We've actually come a long way, which is good, from the 1850s when Dickens was writing, because now there's a lot of thought into what do universities do and what can they do to reach out to their students? And this is a wider conversation, but it does have its roots in thinking about access and accessibility. This is a slide from a picture in Don Marge's book on academic ableism. And he writes about how imposing university architecture is, but frames it within conversations of access and inclusion. He writes about how the physical structures of university serve to make it elite and serve to advertently or inadvertently create barriers of access. So I want to talk a bit about how we can sit conceptualize these barriers to access and how thinking or changing our way of thinking around accessibility can help increase accessibility and help find ways to ensure that as we move forward into an increasingly online educational world, we can use those lessons that we've learned. Because there are various ways of seeing the challenges and the barriers that face our students. This is uh, something which is quite traditional in thinking about accessibility and access, but it's what are the models we use for talking about such issues. So we have here an image of someone who cannot get to where they want to go because they're in a wheelchair and there are steps in front of them. A traditional model for thinking about this is called the medical model of disability. This doesn't mean that all medical practitioners follow this model, but what it means is it says a disability, in this case, mobility issues, is something medically wrong with a person. We could say this is a deficit model. 
It says there's something lacking in someone which could then be addressed or overcome to enable them to attain where they want to be and where we, we would hope as a university to help them get to. So this is a model of, of disability which says there's something maybe magically wrong with a person. This ties into the theory that Dickens was, was very much a part of that Victorian self-help ideology, that there is a self-advocacy implied within here. If someone who has got a disability can advocate for themselves, can find ways around the issue, then they will no longer be disabled by whatever it is that's wrong with them. These are all ways of conceptualizing disability and barriers to access that do exist, but they're not the one that I'm going to be focusing on going forward. And they're not the one that I have in mind with the things that I'm going to be sharing with you, the challenges, but also the solutions to access at university. Because I use the social model, which says the problem is not that this individual has is in a wheelchair. The problem is, is that someone else has built a set of steps in front of them. It's not about what an individual being disabled by a condition. It's about society disabling individuals or groups of people by the structures that are put in place, which mean they cannot achieve what they want to. So this shifts the burden from the individual to society, but it also is a very positive way of looking at things because it means there are things that we can do about it. If we built more ramps, then we wouldn't have people who were disabled from moving from one level to another within the building. And whilst I'm using this in very physical, concrete sense, it still really helps when thinking about how we move education online and how we address access issues online. Because even though we may not have steps online, we still have barriers to access. They've just maybe been switched slightly. So we need to take a social model approach in thinking what are the new barriers that might have been put in place of students and what can we do to address them? So one barrier that happens when we move work online is broadband penetration, which is not equal around the whole world. I'm not saying that people necessarily have the most simplistic idea that I put my work online, that means everyone around the world can access it. We all know that's not true, but it's something to consider if your aim in putting work online is to increase access, especially to increase access to those with fewer resources, because this is a very broad strokes map. Whilst we can see on this map, there are places that have got very low broadband penetration, where you may not expect students within these countries to have the best access to resources. It is also worth bearing in mind that students, like many of those at my university in London, which in general is very well resourced, do not necessarily personally have the resources to have high quality devices or consistent internet access in order to achieve or have or even reach all the resources that have been put online. This is something we are very conscious of during the COVID pandemic and something we continue to be conscious of going forward because we understand that we have an obligation to these students and we can't say that we'll put the work online, they can then come to it. We know we have to do things to help them access this work um, and these educational opportunities. So a question to you, even though I can't see the answers, what accessibility features can you see on this screen? That was a pause for you to think about the answer. I'm gonna give it to you now, or at least one of the main ones that I hope people have noticed is that this video, in fact, all of these videos have got closed captions. It's a really important accessibility feature. It means that students with, for example, limited hearing will be able to know what's being said on the educational video. This is especially important with screencasts or where there's a lag so people can't lip read. Um, it also means that students with less good um, internet access or studying in suboptimal conditions where they might not be able to hear, very, hear the audio on the screen very well, can still access the information. So captions are just one of those very important features that we can include when we put work online or multimedia online. But my next question is, what can't you see? 
because you can't always tell what accessibility features there are or there are not simply by looking at the screen. If you look at this page, one thing you can't see is any download button. I want to point out there is actually a download button, but I haven't included it in the screenshot. It was, it started to get too big, but without seeing it, you can't assume that it's there. You certainly can't see behind the scenes. So you can't see if you can tab through this page rather than navigate it using a mouse, because this would bar, if you can't tab through and you can't use your keyboard to navigate a screen, then someone with mobility issues is not going to be able to access all the information that's on there. You can't see the level of, um, of flexibility. Is this a screen that is going to be adjustable if you look at it on a tablet or on a phone, as well as on a computer screen? Is it still going to be responsive and show users what they need to see in order to play the, the educational videos they might want to? And you certainly can't see if it's compliant with and interacts well with accessibility softwares. So, one of the challenges of creating accessibility is that you need to have the, expert, the expertise within the institution to go behind the scenes to make sure that all of the accessibility features which are possible can be put in place. Because the fact is, is that without expertise and without knowledge of the systems, it is easy to miss things. Often they are invisible and you can't see them. This is important from an ethical point of view for anyone in my audience who is in a country that commonly is, or at least was in the EU when these legislations came out, have also got a legal obligation because in the UK, for example, um, the web content accessibility guidelines are now within law. This means that anything we put up online has to be perceivable. This includes the user interface components. It have to, has to be operable and this includes by keyboard navigation as well as by mouse. It has to be understandable. And this is also to do with just the general behavior of websites. They have to behave in ways that users would expect. And they have to be robust. And this includes the idea of future proofing so that we won't fall behind with our accessibility that, um, obligations simply because technologies change. We know the technologies change and we have to plan and accommodate for these. These principles, in fact, do split down into much more specific guidance. And I would recommend, even if you're not from an EU country, have a look at them and see how they can be made to apply because they actually offer very clear guidance, which is very helpful in creating accessibility checklists and understanding who at different levels of an organization is going to have to be involved in making sure that holistically everything put online and all the systems used online end up meeting the requirements of our students. One thing that can help with this is to go slightly outside the tech world and to look at learning as well, because we are universities. So with this, I'm going to go back to a something of a business metaphor, universal design. Now, universal design came out of business, but I'm going to be looking at universal design for learning. So it's not just about building and design. It's also, sorry, I think I said it came out of business. It didn't. It come, came out of building design. That was just me getting my words wrong. Universal design for learning comes out of universal design for building, but it also applies to an online space. What universal design means that we have to remember that in the scope of our users, in the scope of our learners, we have a huge variety of needs. So we can't deliver things or present things in the same way. Students have got different ways of perceiving. This could be physical, say limited visibility, um, or it could also be cultural. I perceive things in a specific way because of my background and because of where I come from. So we need to make sure that we're accommodating this in our learning design. We need to have multiple means for students to act and express themselves because again, culturally and also for individual needs will lead to different students finding it easier or finding it more appropriate to express themselves in different ways. And we also need to provide multiple means of engagement. This includes things like self-motivation as well as that spark of enthusiasm that we want to engender in all of our students. And universal design for learning says that you can't assume all students are homogenous. You must build in multiple avenues 
and multiple means in all learning design in order to accommodate this. It's not supposed to be an onerous task. It's supposed to be a chance to reevaluate how we design courses and how we design teaching so that we can accommodate for the different needs. Because I said that I would mention decolonizing the curriculum in my blurb to the session. I haven't got much time to do that, but I do want to say this is a picture of a classroom. It's not really one at Queen Mary's. It's just a stock photo I found online. I think we can already imagine some accessibility issues there might be with this room. But the reason I wanted this picture was to raise this issue, which comes from decolonizing the curriculum of do our students see themselves within this classroom, this physical classroom or this online classroom? Do they see themselves as stakeholders within the subject that they're studying? Does this feel like a course which is made for pe people like them? Because a lot of decolonizing the curriculum can be to do with, are we going to broaden the text that we use or the examples that we give? So it doesn't always come from the same maybe elite pool but it's also about what are we going to do to help our students recognize that they have a stake in this course. This course was designed with them in mind, even if they may not be traditional university students, even if they may not feel that they're what others have in their head when they think of a physics student or a medical student or a business student or an art student or an expert in any of those fields. Decolonizing the curriculum feeds into the idea of access and the idea of inclusion. It's about helping our students feel a part of the university community. And so I'm going to end before I move on to questions by just talking about what I have found to be some of the solutions to all of the challenges and the ranges of issues that I've spoken about. What well, is to me this afternoon, maybe for you this morning, which comes from May and Bridges work on developing and embedding inclusive policy and practice in higher education. They write about this kind of positive circle of, of activity and action that can increase in inclusion and increase accessibility. For example, stakeholder interpretation the way everyone within the university interprets terms like inclusion, and this can be more granular, they speak very convincingly about the difference made in one institution where they stop talking about student needs and starting to talk about student entitlement. And this had a real impact on the culture of the university, the ways in which staff from all around the university were starting to meet these entitlements and starting to think about students who, requ who required them. And this mission culture feeds into strategy and policy because it's, it's one of the drivers behind this. And then policy and strategy, of course, then inform stakeholder interpretation. So once you start on this journey, and if it is in, taken on by numerous people across the university, from the curriculum areas, from the technology areas, and also from the high-end strategy areas of the university, then you can start to really change the ways in which individuals act and the ways in which the culture of the university acts to really address this challenge of accessibility, of an inclusion and of access in online education. So that was the end of my talking. I hope you're all able to hear me properly. And um, I believe now I might be around, um, there might be some questions for, for me to answer as well. Thank you, Sosha. That was fascinating and really enlarged the scope of what access should mean uh, to each of us, especially as we go into the realm of online education. A few questions. How have you managed to handle the workload of uh, captioning uh, of videos, slides and everything, both from the faculty viewpoint as well as from other material and open access that might be added to a lecture? So this is um, a difficult one, especially for those of us who are working um, with 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 um, national with national guidelines, because it is a, a huge burden of work. And uh, certainly 2017, 2018, I remember being in lots of quite demoralizing conferences where suggestions were coming up with people saying maybe we just stop doing videos because we simply can't comprehend the burden of work that it will take in order to, to make these accessible. So I would say number one, the answer is not to go down that route, is, is we 
we have to go with that universal design for learning approach and not shut down things which are going to help certain students have access just because there are issues with others. What we're doing in, our, in my university um, is trying to take as reasonable an approach as possible, bearing in mind that we have, we can claim disproportionate burden of work within the legislation. So it's not that we're expected to do everything at once. What we need to do is we need to build policies and processes so that going forward in 10 years time, we won't be facing any issues with this at all because we will have developed the processes. We're looking at automated captioning and we're looking at how much resource do we have to put into the human element of automated captioning because automated captioning is simply not accurate enough. We're looking into contracting and working with other suppliers what's the most cost-effective way for us as an institution to do this? We're, we're in talks with several suppliers to make sure that we can find the best solutions and then match them up with the best subjects centrally. Some subjects have got a bigger demand than others because of technical language used that we need to increase the resource that goes into them. So I would say it's, a, it's about a strategy approach. Um, it's about knowing what the resourcing is, putting resources into it, and then being realistic with how much can we achieve each year. Thanks. And then sort of continuing on the trend that you talked about, the strategy, when you have uh, third party providers, uh, for example, let's say libraries or uh, bibliographic uh, references or software, how do you work with them and whose responsibility should that be? It's a between the university and the provider as to how this is made more accessible. Yes, I'm, I'm afraid we, we don't have a definite, I mean, I can tell you what the legal response is, which is the, <laughs> universities provide, it's the university's obligation because we are bringing right. in these third party tools. In terms of reality, how this works, because we don't have control over those tools. And as I said, is um, it's a difficult call for us. There comes a point where we can't stop using a library system, even if not everything they have on their system is accessible. We have to be very clear with our labeling to students so that they're aware of what, what these systems can provide and where they can go for help if the system is not as compliant as we would like it to be. We need to work with other institutions putting pressure on third party providers, especially very large third party providers that we all use to make sure that we can help them and we can put the pressure on them to meet the obligations. And the third thing is we need to work on our policies. So we have existing relationships which we cannot back out of now. But one thing which has been like, inspiring to see during, during the last few years since the guidelines came in is how IT procurement policies have changed in response to this. So that now when we are bringing in new softwares, we are prioritizing accessibility. This is not something small, it's something which has to be there in our functional and technical requirements. So we're starting to develop the systems to address the issue. We don't have the answers yet. Fascinating, one last question then. Was there any professional development for faculty that was embedded into the strategy to help them make this move? There has been so much professional development built into, um, built into this because there has to be. This is, this is, this is not about, um, as I was hoping I was saying with, with the captions, this is not about taking the work, saying this is what we have to do and then asking other people to find the solutions. This has to be, I mean, holistically inclusive. It includes all the elements of the university and that means all the elements of the university have to be supported in reaching this. Um, one thing which I would say I'm proud of with what we've done is for is is you know, well, I'm always proud if it's not seen as a burden, but seen as something that people understand is, ne is necessary to change things. And that's to do with that culture shift that I spoke at the end, but that can only happen with the kind of stakeholder engagement that comes with resourcing and with training. So that's a simple answer. There's a more complicated one about how we did this, but, but no, I mean, you, you can't put these policies in place without the resourcing and the training behind them. Thank you, Soshi. I'm afraid we're out of time. It's been a fascinating and very illuminating talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.